Thank you. What about the microphone? Is it? Um, okay. I think I can do that. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our health presentation, Straightening the Immune System in the COVID Era. If you are new to our group, we are the Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist Church Community Life Center. Through in-person and online meetings, health seminars, and cooking classes, we seek to improve the physical, mental, and spiritual health of people in our community. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that the bathrooms are located outside on the right side of the sanctuary, on either side of the water fountain. After the presentation, we will have the question and answers session, which will be until 3 p.m. And from 3 to 3.30 p.m., we will have some light refreshments, fruits and tea for our in-person guests to enjoy. As part of our religious practice and spiritual, we like to take the time to pray at the start of our events. Now I will ask Pastor John Piroski to come and say a word of prayer. And those of you who are comfortable doing so are welcome to join us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is a beautiful day outside here in Chicago. I don't know how it is in the places where people are watching us from, uh, but we are alive, we are here by your mercy and by your grace, and we give you glory to that. I also believe that you're the one who created us, and you know what is the best for our bodies, and I'm so thankful for Dr. Angela Subotic that he's going to present today. And let the knowledge sink in and by your power also, by your strength, that we would be able to implement them in our lives. Uh, because when our bodies are healthy, the mind is healthy also, Lord. So I'm thankful for every person here present, and uh, I'm praising your name, that you wonderfully and fearfully created us. And uh, I pray also, and I'm thankful for the power that you will give us that those things would be the part of our life that we are going to learn. Thank you, in the name of Christ, amen. Now I will invite Dr. Raiko Bisivats to present our speaker. Thank you for the large crowd present here today, for all the brave people that came. Uh, those who are here today, you, you I say in your heart, health matters to me. I want to learn how to be a better person, right? How to be a better individual. We understand, at least in this church, that temple is not this building here. What is the temple? That our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we are responsible and we are stewards for God to take care of this temple of the Holy Spirit, right? 
And the introductory verses I wanted to just read that is related to any, this lecture, any lecture on health from Jesus in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus saw the many people and felt sorry for them because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd to lead them. And in 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion for them and healed their sick. We do not know many details in the Bible, but what looks like we read the Gospels that Jesus spent considerably more time healing than preaching. There were many cases where there were throngs of people. From morning to evening, he would heal and heal and heal. And maybe at the end of the day, he gathered them like we have a Mount of Blessing story and he preached to them. But he was healing. And I believe that this time that we're living in the, the precarious times, and Satan will try to invent fake diseases and fake healing, and we need to preach the gospel of true healing. The Lord called this church to that. And Dr. Angela Sobotic uh, is a student of Bible and student of health her whole life. Regardless of the degrees, usually there are some degrees attached when we present this, which are honorable and you know, worthy to mention. But what I want to say personally, on behalf of Angela, I know that she's a student of Bible and student of health, that she's really diligently doing this every single day. Uh, every single day she's digging some studies, she's digging to learn more. I cannot tell you how many countless conversations we have when people have some you know, leisure time to, to, to talk about who knows what about politics. Sometimes we talk about politics too, but not much. We often talk about health. So I always respect and appreciate when somebody's breathing fire and, uh, and life and a spark from, uh, from God to learn something. So she is truly, with her whole mind, body, spirit, dedicated to this work. And the lecture that she's going to present today on the immune system, I do not know if there will be more relevant lecture, especially now in the time of the last two years of crisis, of this uh, 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 sickness going around the world and proper solutions. So no matter what other crisis will come ahead of us in the coming months or years, Lecture today will be very relevant. Please pay attention to what she has to say to learn how to strengthen the immune system because strengthening the immune system doesn't happen in a day or night. It's gonna, it takes months and years. So take her advice and do this for the next months and years. When, when the next crisis comes, you probably won't have to worry that much. So uh, Dr. Angela Subotic, welcome here to present how to strengthen our immune system in the COVID era. Thank you, Husband Ray. Let's get myself situated here for a second. Ooh, I have um, several slides prepared today, and I hope I don't just race through them because it's so lovely that I want everybody to get outside and get some vitamin D while we still have such beautiful weather before it starts getting cold. So I'm gonna have my timer here and try not to talk so much, but uh, let's see. Slides are good. So strengthening the immune system in the COVID era. We could have titled this lecture just about anything regarding the immune system, but Let's move forward. So just a disclaimer, I have to do this because I am not a medical doctor, so please do not consider this medical advice. If you need medical advice, seek um, a medical provider. And any company or any product or something that I will mention, I am absolutely not affiliated with. Nobody is paying me to do this. So <laughs> that's all for the disclaimer. Now here in church, we're always talking about the great controversy between God and Satan. But our bodies are in a great controversy of their own. There's a constant struggle in the body between self and non-self. The body wants to eliminate the non-self. So various viruses, bacteria, toxins, even old cells are non-self. And our immune systems were wonderfully designed by God to protect the body from these non-self pathogens. So what exactly is the immune system? 
You can see all the nice little pictures there. The immune system is a network that consists of the lymphatic system, various cells, organs, proteins, and tissues throughout the body. You probably can't read some of that. Maybe you can, but um, we have a picture of the thymus gland to the upper left, uh, bone marrow, tonsils, lymphatic vessels, spleen, all of these pictures are part of the immune system and it's not in any way comprehensive. But what is the function of the immune system? So simply put, the immune system's job is to distinguish between self and non-self and get rid of non-self. Now this is obviously very, very simplified. The immune system is much more complex, but my goal here is to get you to understand as much as possible and to make changes and things you can do today as soon as we leave. So again, the immune system's job is to distinguish self from non-self. Now who else loves their immune system? Antibody, antibody? <laughs> thank you, thank you for clapping for my joke. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Just some fast facts, some fun facts about the immune system. The number one way to boost our immunity is to reduce stress. Now obviously that's much more easily said than done, especially in today's really super busy world. But stress does impact every cell in our body and when the body feels stressed, it goes into that fight or flight mode, uh, which is basically like a survival mode. And what happens is the immune system becomes suppressed because the body feels that it's not important in those moments of critical times in that fight or flight moment. Sleep affects our immune system. Under five hours of sleep depresses immune function. So too little sleep also can put us in that fight or flight state as well that weakens the system. Uh, an over-sterilized environment weakens the immune system. So just this morning, um, I got a message from my sister-in-law, and she shared with me that she was in the hospital a couple of times with, uh, with a family member, but learned that um, the hospitals are full of young children, babies, infants, who have RSV. RSV is respiratory syncytial virus. And I just did a little search um, when she told me this, and what I found was most medical professionals are attributing this to the lockdowns the last couple of years. So people staying in their homes, the kids not getting out, exposing themselves to germs and such. And the quote I have here, uh, pardon? Yeah, yeah, just this morning. I think the article came out two days ago. So why is there an increase now in RSV in the hospitals? Because it doesn't normally happen around this time of year. It, and these medical professionals said that the virus is encountering a highly vulnerable population of babies and children who were sheltered from common bugs during the pandemic lockdowns. So that over-sterilized environment uh, hand sanitizers, constantly, you know, sanitizing your hands 10 times, wiping everything down. No, I say play in that dirt. <laughs> Get those germs, expose your body, strengthen your immune system. Uh, more fast facts. Allergies are a reaction of the immune system. We don't often think about allergies as being a part of the immune system, but it is. It's an immune response. Um, and my most... Fun fact, people who lack humor in their lives also have a reduced stress response and immune system response. Did you know one minute of anger can weaken the immune system four to five hours? Just one minute of anger. But one minute of laughter will boost your immune system significantly for 24 hours. So that's why children will laugh 400 times a day Adults, unfortunately, laugh only about 40 times a day. So you know that uh, quote in the, in the Bible where Jesus says, 
Truly, I tell you, if you don't become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this morning, Angela tells you, truly, if you don't become like children, you will not have a great immune system. (laughs) I'll give you a moment of laughter here. I have a couple more jokes because I feel it's important to, uh, to boost our immune systems while we're sitting here. You know, we're sitting here not doing very much, so the least we can do is laugh a little bit, I think. So um, in light of the recent baptisms, keep that in mind, there's been a lot of baptisms here. Here's my next joke. So today at church, a guy in a suit tried to drown me. And I kid you not, my family just stood there taking pictures. <laughs> Super cute. Here's one more. Granny, come over. I can't, it's raining, but I'm hungry. I'm coming. (laughs) My grandmother was the same way. (laughs) So laughter. I just want to tell you a little bit about laughter so you can empower your brains and remember to laugh just a little every single day. (sighs) Laughter stimulates many organs in the body. It enhances your intake of oxygen-rich air, stimulates your heart, lungs, muscles, and increases those endorphins that are released by the brain. It activates and relieves your stress response. Laughing and then cooling down your stress response, it can increase and then decrease your heart rate and blood pressure, and what results is feeling relaxed. Laughter also soothes tension. It can stimulate circulation, aid muscle relaxation, and that obviously helps also physical symptoms of stress. And in the long term, laughter will improve your immune system. So negative thoughts manifest into chemical reactions that affect your body negatively by bringing more and more stress into the system, which decreases your immunity. But positive thoughts can increase a release of peptides that fight stress and can potentially fight even more serious illness. Laughter relieves pain, can ease the pain by causing the body to produce its own natural painkillers. Laughter increases personal satisfaction. It makes it easier to cope with people and cope with situations and to connect with people. Laughter improves our mood. Many people will experience depression due to illness, but laughter can help lessen your stress, depression, anxiety, and make you feel happier, and it helps improve your self-esteem. So after this lecture, which again, I promise I will try to keep my best to not talk so much so we can go enjoy the sun, but I hope you will continue laughing with us as we um, have refreshments afterwards, so keep that in mind. Now back to more serious topics. So the immune system has three lines of defense. Uh, The first line of defense that we encounter are the physical and chemical barriers. So the largest organ of our body, the skin. Uh, Tears are a first line of defense. Mucosal linings, so the linings in our passages, in our stomach, Uh, Cilia, the little hairs that trap uh, large particles. Earwax, also that trap large particles. Um, Something maybe you wouldn't consider as a first line of defense, but it definitely is stomach acid. So sometimes we ingest things and they go down into our stomach and it's that stomach acid that kills the bacteria or viruses off before they're able to invade our bodies. Saliva, sweat, other... uh, barriers as well. And finally, we have our resident bacteria, our natural flora. And we will talk about our natural flora a little bit later. So moving along with three lines of defense, in the second line of defense, we have several different white blood cells. And those white blood cells are responsible for a nonspecific response. Um, So they produce things like inflammation, fever, a release of histamine, allergic reactions. I don't know how well you can see the cells, but the neutrophils are the first to respond to a bacteria or a virus. They make up about half of all white blood cells. 
Eosinophils are usually associated with allergy symptoms and will respond to parasitic infections or worms. Um, they're about 5% of the total white blood cell count, and there's a much higher concentration of eosinophils in the digestive tract. Then we have basophils, which are only about 1% of white blood cells. They play a role in asthma. They also release histamine and other chemicals that cause inflammation. And our third line of defense is a uh, spe specific immune response. Um, and this is where we have lymphocytes to respond to specific invaders. So when we think of um, vaccination or antibodies, then we're looking at our third line of response. So by the time we got to that third line, we've had to go through one and two. So it takes quite a bit to get to that third line of defense. Uh, under the specific immune response, like I said, we have the uh, white blood cells called lymphocytes. Um, there's more than two types, but I listed the B cells, which is uh, what creates antibodies, and T cells, which also have a memory and directly kill an invader if they encounter that same invader or intruder again. Now I mentioned at the beginning that the role of the immune system is to distinguish self from non-self. And when God created us and God created the earth, there was so much less non-self that we were exposed to. Now we have so many things that, that our bodies encounter on a daily basis. Um, in my previous lecture, we talked about water quite a bit. Um, there's so many different chemicals in water and gases like chlorine and things that you know, our bodies have to deal with. Um, simple things like cooking, we don't even think twice when we're turning on a gas stove and, you know, that gas is um, attacking our immune system as well. Also, the utensils that we cook with, there's so many chemicals that line these pans and pots and even metal spoons, plastic forks, spoons, all of that stuff. Those are all invaders to our body. Um, pollution, I mean, you name it, everything out there, uh, radiation, pesticides in fruits and vegetables, personal care products that we're putting on our skin, our body's constantly being attacked. Signs that our immune system is out of balance can be food intolerances, allergies, inflammation, uh, sinus problems, recurring or lingering colds and flus. Um, you know, if any of these things are going on, then we might want to more seriously think about how we can get that immune system back into its balance. Now, over the last few years, much of the research on the immune system has actually centered around the gut microbiome. And I have a direct quote here. It is becoming increasingly clear that disease and health really does begin in the gut. Studies have shown that the gut flora has a profound influence on the development and maturation of the immune system after birth. In addition, it has been estimated that as much as 80 to 85% of the immune system is located in our gut. Some people say 70%, but whether it's 70, 80, that's still a huge percentage that relates our gut to our immune function. Now, whoever would correlate something like that before? But we actually have trillions of microorganisms that live inside of us and on our skin, but most of these microbes are actually in our intestines and that is what we refer to as the gut microbiome. And there's so much research and continuing research that shows that the gut microbiome is communicating with the cells of the immune system and essentially controlling how the body responds to infections. So we're going to continue talking about the gut a little bit. So what are some things that will damage the gut? If you look at that picture there, um, in the center, you see there's a bunch of little red things that are seeping through. Um, so this is a, a depiction of leaky gut. So literally, there's separations that occur between the cells and 
undigested food particles and other things will seep through that shouldn't seep through the gut. So some things that will affect the gut, antibiotics. Antibiotics, obviously their job is to kill bacteria, but they're also killing the good bacteria, which is stuff that we want and need to protect our bodies. Uh, diseases can further damage the gut. Stress will damage the gut and a poor diet. I know um, I feel sort of free today to speak because I've been doing it more and more, but in the past, every time I would come up here to the microphone, I think my stomach was in knots from all of the, <laughs> all of the stress chemicals. So we can even physically feel when we're stressed that it, it damages our gut. Another thing um, that we'll talk about, a poor diet can damage the gut. So did you know that simply 100 grams of sugar can neg negatively affect the immune system at least five hours? So when you're sick and you have that Diet Coke, you just prolonged yourself from the body being able to heal itself. Isn't that amazing? Because the sugar is actually feeding that unhealthy bacteria in our gut and it's further creating an imbalance between the good and bad bacteria in the gut. So then you ask, what can we do to heal the gut or to keep the gut healthy? Increased sleep. Sleep is going to affect everything, but increased sleep, reduced stress. Uh, more practically, since as a parent, I know that sometimes uh, stress and lack of sleep just go with the territory. Um, probiotic foods. Uh, when we think of probiotic foods, I want you to think cultured foods, not fermented foods. Some people will interchange the two, but cultured foods actually have beneficial bacteria. So those would be things like miso, uh, sauerkraut that's not heated, uh, kefir and yogurt, and now you have so many kefirs and yogurts that are not just um, cow dairy based, but you have even coconut and you know all sorts of nut yogurts and kefirs as well. And then something we like to talk about here a lot, not just a plant-based diet, but a whole food plant-based diet. And I want us to learn in this church to not simply say plant-based. Plant-based is really, really vague, and there's so many foods that are so-called plant-based but are completely the opposite of healthy. So let's learn to say whole food plant-based, which will mean minimally processed and as close to nature as possible. So with that said, I'm actually going to make a little bit of a divergence here um, before I turn to the next slide, last year, uh, my kids were in, in Pathfinders, and I have not been an Adventist for very long, so I didn't even know that these Adventist food companies even existed until recently, and I wasn't sure why there was a need to have an Adventist food company. I mean, there's food <laughs> of all kinds, but I encountered something like this. So I would like to talk about these meat substitutes. Um, plant-based diet, obviously plant-based diet has so many benefits to it, but only if we include a whole food plant-based diet. So when we look at these two pictures, meat, just regular old meat, I have up there the ingredients of turkey bacon versus the meat substitute. I don't think it takes any kind of knowledge to see that what is on the right is definitely not close to nature by any means. Uh, there's no way that a huge long list of ingredients is going to be healthy even if you don't compare it to the one on the left. Now, several of those ingredients, and I will point some out, um, have actually known side effects. 
that cause diarrhea, vomiting, headaches, asthma, the list goes on and on. Uh, some of those ingredients are modified cornstarch, artificial flavors, sodium sulfite, and there's others up there. Now at the very bottom of that ingredient list, uh, you'll see some added B vitamins. Thank you, that's a very nice gesture. But unfortunately, some of those vitamins are actually synthetic, so not natural to our bodies. So they're actually gonna choke our cells from taking the natural nutrients that our cells need. So I wanna point out some of those. Thiamine mononitrate, peroxidine hydrochloride, riboflavin, those are all synthetic B vitamins. Um, the very last one doesn't say what form it's in, the vitamin B12. But um, when somebody does not list the form of B12, then nearly 100% of the time, it is in the form of cyanocobalamin. And what that literally is, is cobalamin, which is B12, attached to a molecule of cyanide. I don't know about you, but yes, cyanide does occur in nature. There's some foods that have cyanide, but to continually put stuff like this in your body and ask it to filter it out, um, I would just rather not. <laughs> and then I'll also point out um, the artificial food dyes in there. Red number three and yellow number six. And if you would like these slides or like to see anything, I mean, you can look this up on their website, Morningstar Farms. Um, their ingredient list is up there. But uh, just a word on food dyes. So here is a, um, the conclusion of a research article that talks about the toxicology of food dyes. And it actually says, red number three causes cancer in animals and goes on to say three other dyes, red 40, yellow five, and yellow six. Now remember in the, that food product, we had red three and yellow six. So yellow six uh, have been, has been found to be contaminated with benzodyne and other carcinogens. At least four dyes, which include blue one, red 40, yellow five, and yellow six can cause hypersensitivity reactions. And this can go on and on, but the whole point is Artificial food dyes, God did not create artificial food dyes. We have beautiful things like beets that can create a wonderful red color if we wanna you know, color our food in, in some way. There's natural ways to make your food look pretty if that's what you're going for. But food dyes have no place in, in our food. So that's the end of my divergence. We'll get back to the gut. So poor gut health can lead to a variety of issues. I talked a little bit about leaky gut, but leaky gut will create sinus uh, problems, um, can lead to frequent colds, food sensitivities, even brain issues such as depression, anxiety, ADHD, skin issues, acne, eczema, psoriasis, thyroid issues, colon problems, adrenal problems, joint problems, you name it. So what can we actually do to heal our gut or maintain a healthy gut? Number one I have listed is to drink water on an empty stomach. Now why do I say an empty stomach? So when we are taking food in, the first place our food encounters is our mouths, right? And we have saliva that comes and does the first initial breakdown of food in the mouth. And saliva needs water. Well, that water needs time to process, to create the saliva. And not just to create the saliva, but to create the hydrochloric acid in our guts. So once it goes through our mouth and we're chewing it and it enters our uh, gastrointestinal tract in our, in our stomach, it encounters hydrochloric acid. Now hydro is water. So if we don't have enough water ahead of time, we're not going to be able to produce that hydrochloric acid in our stomach that's going to break down our food. So we need about 30 minutes or so before we eat food 
to drink plenty of water, that we're not going to be chugging the water while we're eating. And I've seen various things about when to drink water afterwards. Um, depending on the kind of meal, if you have a light carbohydrate meal of some sort, it's going to get digested much faster so you don't have to wait that long. But if you have a good solid protein meal with some beans, you know that stuff sits and it takes longer to digest. So you don't want to drink water too soon afterwards. Possibly even wait an hour or two after the meal to drink again. But make sure to have enough before you eat. Plenty of water before you eat to get that body ready to digest the foods. If, that, um, if that's not incentive for you, drinking water also help, drinking water before you eat helps with weight loss as well. You're actually kind of tricking your body to say, oh, I'm not as hungry as I thought I was. So another little incentive. Uh, number two in steps to heal the gut, um, there's actually estimates that say that between 60 and 80% of the population is deficient in magnesium. Now magnesium is necessary for more than 300 processes in our body. Um, and there's actually certain conditions, some medications that will make it hard for the body to maintain their magnesium levels. Uh, some of those might be things like type 2 diabetes, Crohn's, cel celiac disease. Um, so they actually need extra help with magnesium. But magnesium um, activates the enzymes that break down and absorb our food, the fats, proteins, and carbs. And it also helps to moderate that stomach acid as well. Uh, good food sources of magnesium, um, basically a whole food, plant-based diet, things like nuts, seeds, beans, Chocolate, it's a vice of mine, but hey, I get my magnesium from there sometimes. Other ways to heal the gut. Number three, to restore gut bacteria after antibiotics. Antibiotics, I understand sometimes they can be necessary or maybe you've had them even in the past. Um, things that will help restore the gut, eating probiotic foods, I don't know why I have fermented foods in there. Maybe I wanted to mention what I mentioned earlier, but it's not the fermented foods that are gonna restore your gut bacteria, it's those cultured foods, like miso and sauerkraut, kefir, and that sort of thing. And then there's a really funny name up there, Saccharomyces boulardii. Um, anytime anyone in my family has to take um, an antibiotic, or if we've taken some kind of a very strong herb even, that kills off bacteria in the gut. Um, I take a supplement of Saccharomyces boulardii. This is actually a yeast, so it's not going to get killed off by um, an antibiotic, but it helps to prevent the growth of um, C. diff bacteria, which is uh, what gives people diarrhea sometimes after taking a round of antibiotics. So anytime I do antibiotics of any kind, I take Saccharomyces boulardii um, just to help maintain that, that gut balance. Number four, I think we need to eat more fiber. Um, I think the estimate is 95% of Americans do not eat enough fiber. And why it's so important, uh, it actually feeds that healthy gut bacteria. And it also helps to remove excess fats and estrogens. Now there's so many things in our environment that mimics estrogen. It looks like estrogen to our body. So eating fiber is actually gonna help with removing some of those. Uh, number five, uh, soaking or sprouting beans, seeds, nuts, and grains will also help with the gut. Um, beans and seeds, nuts and grains, they contain an acid called phytic acid, which can sometimes block the body's absorption of minerals. Um, so some of those minerals that get blocked are calcium, magnesium, iron, zinc, chromium, and manganese. So when we soak or sprout the beans, seeds, nuts, and grains, it helps to um, minimize that phytic acid so that these nutrients can be absorbed into the body. 
And another thing that will enhance the absorption of these minerals are um, our, our favorite garlic and onions. <laughs> and we should, um, we should try to eat you know, a little bit of garlic and onions every day and, and just say, hey, I'm gonna do it. If you smell, I'll smell. We'll just have a, a smelly party. <laughs> So going back to the slide of the immune system, um, you will recall that the immune system is a network that consists of the lymphatic system, cells, organs, proteins, and tissues. So what exactly is this mysterious lymphatic system? The lymphatic system is a part of the immune system. It's also a part of the circulatory system as well and it acts as a like drainage or sewer system. Its primary role is to cleanse the cells by absorbing excess fluid, fat, and toxin from our tissue. So it takes the fluid, filters it, and actually returns it to the bloodstream. And the fluid that moves through the lymphatic system is called lymph fluid. Lymph needs to move freely throughout the lymph vessels to clean up the body. And this fluid circulates in one direction very slowly, and it moves um, by us breathing or by physical body movement. Uh, in the lymph nodes is where the lymph gets filtered and where the fighting of infections actually happens. So sometimes this lymph fluid can slow down, stop moving, become stagnant, and what happens, we'll have enlarged lymph nodes. There's swelling, you can have infection, redness, and such. So getting this lymph moving is very important to our immune system functioning properly. And this is one reason that exercise and moving the body is so important. When we exercise, we're moving that lymph system. So keeping that lymph flowing, keeping the lymph um, working with the immune system to keep us healthy. But this lymph system can become polluted by toxins. Um, it can, uh, with nutritional deficiencies, not function properly. And with a lack of activity or ex exercise, as I've said, the lymph slows down and doesn't function as well. Some signs that your lymphatic system is polluted um, skin conditions can be one sign of a polluted limb system. Um, arthritis, injuries that are not explained, uh, cellulite, sinus infections, and as I've mentioned, uh, enlarged lymph nodes. And you can maybe see on that picture, let's see if I can highlight this a little bit, oops. That's all right, but our, Lymph system runs throughout our entire body, um, but especially important, we have a lot of lymph nodes around the breast area and around the armpits. Most of us are wearing deodorants every single day, and we're actually blocking these lymph nodes. So I wanna challenge you, I understand if you need to wear something, but um, look to those more natural deodorants, or just try to go without. Um, Surprisingly, when you go without, you will get used to it. How about the others, Pastor says? Well, when you clean up your diet, when you clean up your diet, you will not smell as much, right? But uh, I understand, you know, when you're, when you're home, when you're alone, when you're not around people, um, there's no need to let, let the sweat come out. The sweat is good, you know? Let your body release itself of toxins, why not? So I talked about exercise and stimulating the lymph flow. There's actually herbs that can help to uh, stimulate lymph flow. Echinacea, astragalus, golden seal, parsley, cilantro. Um, these are little things we can incorporate in our, you know, in our daily diets. I personally really like cilantro and parsley. I like to include them in my guacamole on a daily basis. 
Um, but what else stimulates lymph flow? Deep breathing, so taking in deep, long breaths. Uh, there's something called lymphatic drainage massages. May maybe you've even heard of lymphatic drainage massages. Um, I think a lot of massage therapists will do this lymphatic drainage, so they're specifically working on moving that lymph flow. Um, avoiding toxins will help stimulate lymph flow. Uh, avoiding tight clothing. When you're wear, wearing something restrictive, then the fluids in your body cannot move. Uh, it's important to drink enough water. Obviously, this fluid is water, but if it becomes very um, viscous and not fluid-like, then it's gonna slow down that flow. Dry brushing. Uh, have any of you heard of dry brushing? So there's these, um, they look like, almost like horse brushes or something. They're about this long. There's a big head of a brush and a, a, long, a long stick. And you can literally like massage yourself with this brush to stimulate lymph flow. Um, there's specific ways in doing this, so I'm not gonna talk about this right now, but because our lymph is moving generally in one direction, you wanna kinda of start from the bottom, work your way up very slowly, very gently. The idea isn't to get in there and scrub. We're not trying to take off layers of our skin. We're trying to gently stimulate our lymph flow. Uh, what else? Hot and cold showers will, will stimulate lymph flow. I know we've talked about hot, cold showers uh, many times before, but there's so many, so many things that can um, be benefited from those hot, cold showers. Also, uh, infrared saunas will help stimulate. And something I didn't put up here, but there's actually um, even machines, uh, machines that include light and gentle uh, electrical impulses. Um, there's many practitioners that have machines like this that will uh, stimulate that lymph flow. So since we talk a lot about uh, foods in general, um, when it comes to the immune system, these are sort of the basics of what we need to, uh, to keep our immune system healthy, especially in a time when it's being attacked. Vitamins A, C, and D, zinc, essential fatty acids, probiotics, and prebiotics, which are uh, fibrous foods. I'm not gonna talk about this too much. You can all take a picture, and um, if you have any questions, we can discuss that later. But something I do wanna talk about, um, there's a lot of research lately about medicinal mushrooms. This uh, particular article comes from last year, 2021. Can medicinal mushrooms have prophylactic or therapeutic effect against COVID and mnemonic superinfection and complicating inflammation? So in this article, they highlight three different medicinal mushrooms. Um, Agaricus blase, which can be commonly called merle, uh, Herisium arenaceus, which is um, lion's mane, and Graffola frondosa, which is a maitake mushroom. So what it says here, medicinal mushrooms have documented effects against different diseases, including infections and inflammatory orders, disorders. So just kind of a blanket statement about all medicinal mushrooms. They have an effect against diseases, including infections and inflammatory disorders. Now the ones I mentioned, the merle, lion's mane, and maitake, have been shown to exert antimicrobial activity against viral agents and parasites. The mushrooms uh, should also be active against multi-resistant microbes as well. So sometimes when people are taking antibiotic after antibiotic, the um, bacteria in the gut and in the body become resistant to some of these antibiotics, but even in those cases, mushrooms are found to be effective. It continues, 
since uh, these mushrooms also have an anti-inflammatory property, they may be suited for treatment of the severe lung inflammation that follows COVID infection. And I will not read the rest of that, but you get the point. Uh, medicinal mushrooms um, are something we can think about to, um, to help prevent or even treat COVID potentially, according to this article. Also a recent article highlighting uh, shiitake, lentinella edodes. Um, it talks about the inhibition of flu virus infection and says that a whole extract from this shiitake um, has shown to have antiviral effects against the hepatitis C virus, herpes, and even HIV. So medicinal mushrooms, um, and this article is from 2018, are just a really hot, hot topic in current research. Now we don't encounter some of these medicinal mushrooms that often except for in supplementation form, but we do encounter the white button mushrooms in every grocery store. So this article uh, looked at dietary supplementation with white button mushrooms, and it actually was shown to enhance natural killer cells of the immune system. So natural killer cells, cells are part of that specific immune response, which was the third line of defense that we um, saw earlier. And also keep in mind what this first sentence says. Mushrooms are reported to possess anti-tumor, antiviral, and antibacterial properties. So I'm going to challenge you on a daily basis to try incorporating some exotic mushrooms into your diet. Now this chart, um, it lists some of the more common medicinal mushrooms that we see uh, across the top are agaricum, chaga, cordyceps, lion's mane, maitake, reishi, and turkey tail. And on the left-hand side, you will see all of the various things that, um, that these different mushrooms will help support. Uh, down toward the middle, you can see immune response. And exactly like Pastor said, under the immune response, it checks off every single mushroom. But um, if you look further to the right, when in doubt, reishi. <laughs> Now I will make a note here. Um, I've been asked before, there's, like I said, the immune system is very complex. We cannot possibly touch on everything, but there's something called a Th1 and Th2 pathway in the immune system. Um, people who have autoimmune conditions, um, they might encounter this a little bit more often. Um, there's some talk about mushrooms um, putting people out of balance who are already out of balance, who have autoimmune conditions. So like I said, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm just presenting um, my research here to you. And when in doubt, reishi. So this is a picture of um, a bag of, of powdered mushrooms that I incorporate in, in my diet. And I wanted to just point out some things when it comes to buying mushrooms. If you buy them like this, powdered or in supplemental form or something like that. The active components of mushrooms um, are beta-glucans. And the highest concentration of beta-glucans are found in the actual fruiting body, like the actual bulb, the, the mushroom itself. Now, some companies sell mushroom mycelium. Mycelium is sort of the um, stage of mushroom before it starts to fruit. 
And this mycelium has much, much less of the active components, much less of the beta-glucans than the fruiting body. So if you do buy some of these powdered mushrooms of sorts, pay attention that it's not the mycelium, that it's actually the fruiting body. So that's kind of the whole purpose of, um, of this slide, really. Uh, in, on the back of this, um, this particular company, the real mushroom, you will actually see the percentage of beta-glucans, and theirs is listed at about 20%. Um, a good company will list their percentage of beta-glucans. If it's not listed, then you can probably make a bet that it's not one of the um, fruiting bodies, but mycelium that we're trying to avoid. So I am coming toward the end here, and I wanted to share with you, um, I don't know how well you can see it, but a, a hot cocoa recipe where I include my, um, my mushrooms sometimes. Um, I will put powdered mushrooms in my food when I'm cooking or whatever, um, but you can also use them for fun recipes like hot cocoa drink. I'll give you a second there to take a picture. And the second recipe I have listed um, doesn't contain mushrooms, but generally uh, foods that are considered very powerful for the immune system. So at the very top we have uh, turmeric, which is um, a wonderful anti-inflammatory that can help balance the immune system. Ginger, which is also anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, um, very good for the intestinal system. It inhibits the growth of bad bacteria in the gut. And uh, then we have lemon. There's many benefits of lemon, but um, one I would like to point out is that it actually, even though lemon itself is acidic, uh, the lemon creates an alkaline environment in our cells. And that alkaline environment, uh, bacteria and viruses don't want an alkaline environment. So just adding lemon to your water or lemon to your, your foods um, helps to create that environment that detracts the viruses and bacteria from sticking. Then um, some of these optional ingredients, cayenne pepper uh, helps promote a healthy gut contains a good amount of vitamin A. It's also excellent for the circulatory system as well. And then um, why is black pepper in here? Black pepper actually helps uh, curcumin from turmeric to be absorbed better. So that is all I have for you today so that we can continue discussion and enjoy some refreshments, get outside, get some vitamin D, um, laugh a little, enjoy each other's company. But does anyone have any questions for me now? We'll grab the mic. And Ray, I don't know if you wanna come and join me and take some of this as well. Ray is my right-hand man in everything. <laughs> so how much water before the meal? How much water before yeah. the meal? And do button mushroom, mushrooms have any value? So do button mushrooms have value? Yes. So that study actually showed that even button mushrooms um, help the immune system. Probably not as much as some of the medicinal mushrooms that are a little bit stronger with um, their activity. But yes, even incorporating button mushrooms. Um, and your first question, how much water? Um, I will give you sort of a vague response first. Um, enough water so that you will not be thirsty for the next hour or two. What does that mean practically? A glass or two of water? Before the meal. Before the meal. Yeah. Enough water so your body has time to make the hydrochloric acid, the saliva, and to not be thirsty. Now, if you you know, find yourself becoming thirsty during the meal, after the meal, try to take small sips and not guzzle. Yeah. I just want to make a quick comment about mushrooms. 
Uh, you can ask questions about any individual mushroom as much as you want, but I always try to present to my clients a large picture. Why medicinal mushrooms like reishi, chaga, lion's mane are so useful? Because they, gr they grow in a very difficult environment. So everything in the world, doesn't matter if it's blueberries, if it's any of the berries, right? Doesn't matter if it's a plant or an herb, if they grow, in, grow up in a harsh environment, they are fighting themselves to produce antioxidants and elements for their own protection, and that's why they're so good for us. So blueberries grown in a high, higher mountains area are much healthier than blueberries grown you know, in, a, in a very warm climate. So mushrooms like chaga, I just got yesterday chaga directly from Siberia, from Russia. I don't know if you've seen Siberia, I went to Siberia twice. That stuff, the place is crazy cold. Baikal Lake is one of the cleanest lakes in the world because it freezes. So chaga that grows in Siberia is absolutely much more potent than anything grown in the United States. So yes, butter mushrooms are fine, but try to find mushrooms that grow in a very difficult environment. So I'm gonna mention, she didn't mention all of them, but reishi, cordyceps, lion's mane, chaga, those are some of the best mushrooms in the world, and there are many drinks today, really. You can just make a drink and make it fun. Well, I'm not using exactly what she's using in a drink because I'm a tough man to take like a, without any maple syrup. <laughs> it just tastes great. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't taste good. And it tastes, uh, some of them actually taste awful when I take them as it is. Uh, but I didn't, uh, if you ever watched the Superman movies many years ago, you know, take crazy stuff, but then you get transformation, you know. <laughs> I'm just joking a little bit, but you know, it, even some of this stuff may not be tasty, but you will really feel after half an hour some kind of a surge of energy going on when you have, have these mushrooms. And mushrooms, these medicinal mushrooms, is probably one of the best gifts God gave us. Second one, Can you put the slides back? second gift that God gave us in terms of nature are barks of certain trees. Barks of the trees. For example, white willow tree has a bark from which we originally got aspirin. So white willow bark, when it's made, made an exact extract, is amazing for your immune system, but also to keep your blood flowing, right? There is another tree called white larch. So look online for the white larch tree bark extract. It's called the rabinogalactans. Uh, there is not much, much time on this whole lecture, but the rabinogalactans is one of the best uh, uh, sugars that is found in the bark of the tree. So mushrooms and barks, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll answer that one second. Um, Yes, I, I want to address what he just said a bit. So um, we all have heard the statement that echinacea is good for the immune system, right? So echinacea is a polysaccharide, like a large chain sugar, basically. Mushrooms are also these large chain sugars. The arabinogalactins that he's mentioning as well are also large chain sugars. So these large chain sugars, the mushrooms, arabinogalactins, echinacea, and so on, um, they are just supporting the immune system, basically. And by the way, the Nobel Prize was just awarded, I believe last few weeks, on studies of glycans. So glycan has to do with the sugars. Uh, th thank you, Angela, that was a very good explanation. I'm gonna just expand on this just a tiny bit. All the sugars, carbohydrates, can be divided in three categories. Super simple sugars that we're trying to avoid, like a table sugar, right? That's gonna make you a different glycemic response. There are complex sugars like grains, when you eat wheat, millet, quinoa, whatever, those are complex sugars. But the most complex sugars are these polysaccharides that she just expanded on, uh, mushrooms, barks to the trees, certain plants. So those super complex sugars, they have no response, no effect on the insulin and sugar response in the body. But why the Nobel Prize was awarded to this? Every single cell in the body out of the 100 trillion cells is coated with these polysaccharides, and if it's not, your immune system suffers. So in science, especially those who, who watch it or who are present who are doctors may not understand this better, the cells have something called lipid bilayer. So there's a lot of uh, fatty, essential fatty acids making the membranes of the cells. But what the newest science shows is that this layer of polysaccharides, this glycan is, is incredibly important for the cell-to-cell -cell immunity. So this is a profound stuff. And by the way, this COVID crisis in the last two years, you know what we noticed? People that got the worst response to COVID virus or even to COVID immunization were people that have a messed up bi a microbiome. The same people who responded to COVID badly, this was a long puzzle to doctors and hospitals. Why simply get a COVID and nothing, right? They go away for that in a few days and suddenly get COVID and suffer long term and they have even long term COVID. 
So microbiome is much more complex answer than what I'm telling you right now, but microbiome, what is your gut state, is one of the reasons why people responded badly to COVID and to COVID immunization because of the microbiome response. So this polysaccharide, I'm not telling you this is gonna heal anything, but it's a, a wonderful foundation for you to not to succumb in a bad state to any other virus coming in the past. So sister's question was, um, how do white button mushrooms compare to some of the other mushrooms, correct? Portobello's, yeah. So those are not generally considered medicinal. Yes, they're going to be effective, but not as effective as some of the other ones. So I brought this slide back, um, which actually shows different medicinal mushrooms. And even within here, there's different properties, um, you know, different nutrients within each one of them that will support different systems. So you're gonna get more benefit from these, especially reishi, like I said, when in doubt reishi. <laughs> than you will from the white buttons. What you can find in the store that is most useful is probably maitake, because you don't find in the stores often mushrooms you can eat that are healthy, but maitake is probably the healthiest in the store. Is it bad to cook reishi or is it wrong? And it can be Yeah, I'll repeat. So the question is, is it best to eat them raw or heat them, cook them? Yeah, do you want to answer or do you want me to answer? Uh, I, I, I believe that you can eat them either way. Um, I haven't done enough study to know if you are reducing the beta-glucans or other active components by heating, so I can't fully answer that question. Uh -oh. But I know that the, hang on one second, right? Um, I know that the, the powdered ones that I use, they are um, heated very lightly and, and dried under uh, low temperatures, so not, not super hot to destroy you know, enzymes and things like that. Yeah, actually I need to add something here because I studied this a little bit more. So the best um, mushroom processing is dual extraction. Uh, dual extraction, dual, two, right? It has to be extracted into hot water to a certain temperature. Not super hot, but not really super mild either. Uh, so actually fairly good heat temperature is necessary to extract these uh, beta-glucans. And then you, they use alcohol extraction. Alcohol can be later on removed and turned into powder, so there's really no alcohol effect. And usually they use organic alcohols. Uh, but the, the best one to, to get the highest amount of beta-glucans use uh, hot water extraction and alcohol extraction. I have a question about this uh, almond milk and actually all the substitutes of the milks because uh, what I heard, uh, if you treat uh, the nuts and try to extract the milk from them, sometimes they use some components that are not very healthy for the body. And uh, comparing to this, I know that, uh, especially lately, Orange White said that we don't have to use animal food this include the milk from the cows and all this stuff, but uh, there's something that we especially need for vitamin B12, this is yogurt. Can you tell us something about this? Because uh, we see that the environment is very polluted and everything this is coming to the animals uh, and especially with the milk that we're doing. I, I don't use the raw milk, uh, I mean, but uh, about this uh, supplement like uh, Almond milk and coconut milk, just to tell us about. All right, so my understanding is you're asking about nut milks and alternative milks in general. That was the first part of your question? Yes. Yes. So. Yogurt, because yogurt cannot be substituted for nothing. And yogurt is very good, especially for vitamin B12 for the body and for the. Right, right. Um, I think when, we, when we're thinking about getting rid of animal products in our diet in general, um, and I, I agree with Sister White that more and more, you know, animals and animal products are becoming worse and worse for, 
for our consumption because of the way the animals are treated, what they're fed, all of the conditions, everything is going in the wrong direction. But I think um, we need to sort of rethink this whole idea of food in general and not look for substitutes. We just wipe these things away. We rethink our diet. We just go back to eating whole foods. We don't need to think in terms of substitution. Now, yes, um, by avoiding uh, animal products, it becomes more difficult to get the B vitamins and vitamin, vitamin B12 in general. Yeah. Um, do you want to continue the question? Uh, no, I think this is a pretty good answer. I mentioned last time, God didn't create nut milks, right? Uh, I tell to my clients, uh, apple grows in tree, apple pie doesn't. Eat apple, not Why apple not? pie, right? So uh, sp let me just explain about nuts. Maybe it was not clear, maybe a different audience was here present. Uh, think about this. If you lived 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and you're passing by almond tree, how long would it take you to extract that almond out? You have to have some stone, you have to beat it like crazy, it would be difficult, and if you got a handful, you're a lucky man, right? Try to chew those almonds. Do, uh, pay attention how long it's gonna take you to chew almonds, long time. Out of all the food, nuts are the hardest to chew. It takes forever to chew them, right? So now, imagine this, again, they never existed in human society before. You're taking now maybe 1% of almonds, highly pulverize them, and put them in 99% of liquid. What you're doing, you're flushing this almond proteins way too fast without being ever digested into your intestinal system, and it's a very fast route to get almond allergies. Because how do we get allergies? Uh, this is the problem with modern society, eating too fast. You need to eat food slowly, in peace, maybe listen to some classical music, something laugh nice. Laugh a little. Laugh a little, relax, you know, just have a nice family atmosphere. Chew for a long time, not gulp in a few seconds, and then, the first organ of digestion is our eyes. You see beautiful food, right? Then nose, you smell, wow. And just olfactory organs, just smelling the food started producing uh, juices, right, in the stomach. But chewing food for a long time, and these uh, glands here that produce saliva, they produce enzyme that is not found anywhere else, only here. So if you're not chewing your almonds, but drinking your almonds, there's no time to connect, right? So chewing the food and tasting and smelling, connect. when you drink almond milk, you don't, do not even smell or taste almond milk. You just kind of have all these artificial flavors. So I'm strongly against nut milks. Use what God created. I'm against cow's milk, especially in modern cows. You know, all cows used to be smaller and had different kind of protein, but most of the world still lives on sheep and goat milk. Sheep and goat milk is similar to, similar to human body. If you want to use milk replacement, only thing that I allow reluctantly would be maybe uh, hemp milk because it's, that's not as strong protein as almonds, and coconut milk. You know, even that, chew your liquids. One doctor told us in the lecture, I always remember this, chew your liquids. Even if you have a coconut milk, take a sip and keep it in your mouth for a while. Body, God made us to connect with the food through chewing process, right? And almonds are some of the most allergenic foods. So all the nuts, that's why schools have all these policies about nut allergies. Do you know what, in my country where I grew up, there were no nut allergies. There was very hardly to hear about it. Nut allergies exist in this country because of the milk replacements. Because kids are given nuts too late and they're eating in a hurry. If you introduce a tiny amount of nuts when kids are seven, eight months old, but maybe just a tiny speck and then wait two, three weeks, they would be having less chance to have nut allergies. That's what I did with my kids. And they were fine, right? So no to almond milk, my opinion. You don't have to listen to me, <laughs> just my opinion. No to no nut milks, chew your nuts. Especially almonds, walnuts, chew them for a long time and no more than a handful because it's difficult to get more than a handful in nature. Nuts are amazing uh, a snack, but not in a milk form. I saw another hand here, okay. Oh, I really appreciate your um, emphasis on the whole foods. I, I think that's, so uh, how do you balance that um, against like mushroom powder and, and extracts and stuff? Because, you know, normally we don't have access to um, things grown in very difficult climates. This is a good question, actually. You're right. Uh, you're asking a logical question based on what I just said right now. 
So my answer is, you should move to Siberia. <laughs> you should move to Siberia and go in this minus 40 degree te uh, freezing temperature and go collect the chaga. And I have seen people collecting chaga, it's very difficult, and eat it, you know. Uh, that's, that would be the best. Uh, but uh, so uh, ask Angela, if you s send her your email list, I'm gonna send you my list of foods to eat. And s somebody asked me just recently, how do you, did you collect this list? I collected this list based on decades of my experience, based on blue zone studies. Blue zones are people that live over 100 years of age and based on my intuitive you know, knowledge. Uh, but uh, I have a very nice, uh, concise list what to eat. So the whole issue here is eat as close to nature as possible. Unfortunately, we cannot eat exactly like Adam and Eve ate. So if I look at the medicinal mushrooms in powder, it's a very little processing. It's not far from the nature and has a lot of benefits. So the, you do not confer the same benefit drinking almond milk. Actually, there are a lot of negatives with almond milk in my mind. With mushroom powder, it's really, if I, if you, it's a lecture, I cannot spend time, but you and I can sit down together, I'll explain to you the process, how it's done. You'll see that it's really not that much harmful to, to, to create mushroom powder. It's not too much even processing. You're still really getting benefits. I always, when I take these mushrooms, I thank God for somebody having patience to do this. You know, to collect chaga in Siberia, to put it together. But really, Siberia and chaga, how this process is really not minimally processed. It's not that much processing. But it's very good for you, so I'm thankful that this exists. Shiitake mushrooms they sell at Costco. Those dried bags of shiitake <laughs> mushrooms. They had Chinese label on that that Angela was wondering. <laughs> they had a Chinese letter to the label. Yeah, when it comes to anything at Costco, beware a lot of stuff comes from China. I've encountered broccoli from China in Costco. So no, not, not to be against China. There's no, a lot of good, good stuff in China. Very polluted. Yeah, like there are some mountains in China that are pristine, and there's some white tea that comes from there is amazing. So it doesn't mean that coming from China is bad. But, you know, China is also one of the most polluted countries, and my answer is I don't know. Maitake is amazing. Is that particular product good? I do not know. I would rather go to the store, buy real maitake, fry them slightly, very low you know, heat, um, personally. I avoid my taki from Costco, but they might be good. I don't know. Anybody else? I think everybody's ready to go and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, eat as simple as possible online and question? eat whole foods. <laughs> okay, there is one here. You mentioned egg yolk. Does it have to be organic egg or any kind? And the next one, what place should we look the mushrooms are from? Mushrooms are from? That's the egg yolk. Oh, egg yolk. Um, well, ideally, when it comes to any of these products that come from animals, we want to know who is growing this stuff who is taking care of the, the hens and um, what kind of food they're eating and are they outdoors and getting light and not crowded and you know that that would be the best case scenario that we are that we have our own <laughs> that we can you know collect. And being organic is not enough. Yeah. Or, or, or what is the brand name of bags that we get? Well, uh, we get Pete and Jerry's, but and Jerry. I'm not entirely certain if they are the absolute best. But organic is not necessarily as important as things like cage-free, um, grass-fed. Yeah. There's, there's so many different labels. I, I agree. It's very difficult to I, I investigated almost any egg we can find in the market. I, yes, it's important to be organic uh, because even organic eggs, they found some traces of glyphos glyphosate inside but much less, maybe 10, 100 times less than inorganic eggs. So it's difficult. But our experience is Pete and Jerry. This is the brand I like to buy in Whole Foods. I feel their uh, egg yolk is the most vibrant and healthiest. They have them at Pete's as well. Pete's uh, I eat egg yolks raw. Uh, that's what's done in the cultures forever. My kids grew up on the raw egg yolks. You should fry whites, but egg, if it's organically healthy, you should eat it raw. 
because when you oxidize the egg, your uh, cholesterol is very unhealthy for you. This is the difference between somebody who has high cholesterol and healthy and high cholesterol and unhealthy. So it doesn't even matter how much cholesterol you have, it matters if it's oxidized or not. Actually, for, for my, our clients, we actually do a blood test for oxidized cholesterol. Not just for cholesterol, we actually do separately blood tests for oxidized cholesterol. So egg yolk, I prefer raw. Uh, what is the other question, the portion of the question? Sure. They are, they are doing this. Yeah, so uh, last time I mentioned a couple of things with, with a specific brand that we use and somebody objected how we are, you know, talking about business uh, on Sabbath. I, we, we really, uh, even what I mentioned last time was you can obtain online, you don't have to obtain from any specific place, but even Angela mentioned some mushrooms. We're not affiliated with any of these companies, but what I personally seem to like lately is this real mushroom brand. You can find it online, you can find it in the stores. Again, we have no affiliation, no business with these companies. But it seems that this real mushroom uh, father and son are guiding this firm, they are very dedicated to collecting these mushrooms properly. So that seems to be one of the better brands that you find online. Uh, uh, there is another one called Fungi Perfecti. So, uh, but real mushrooms seems to be good and they have powder and they taste fairly good. Uh, Angela drinks every day the drink from them. I drink them as, as they are without any additions of sweeteners. So real mushrooms, that seems to be my current conclusion is the better mushrooms online. All right, thank you, everybody. Mikhaila, were you going to close? Okay. I know we, we spent just one second, spent a lot of time talking about mushrooms because that was the last part of my presentation, but please don't neglect your gut. I think that's even more important than this. This was just a fairly new research, but we really want to focus on that gut health. Yeah, take probiotics daily. Uh, you can talk to, to, to Angela what probiotics to get probiotics. Vitamin C, zinc. Zinc is extremely important for the immune system. So those basic nutrients. Uh, the, I know there are certain advanced population that doesn't like anything in supplements. And it's hard to get from food. But if you want to get zinc from food, pumpkin seed is the best. Especially there's one from Austria called heirloom pumpkin seeds from Austria. It's amazingly good taste. Zinc is, uh, pumpkin seed has the richer source of zinc. Uh, you need to really have a lot of zinc, vitamin C, those basic nutrients, uh, good probiotics, daily in diet, you know, if not mushrooms. That's all. I want to thank you everyone who joined us today in person and online. And I just want to remind you that this session was recorded and it's going to be available to watch online later at any time on our YouTube channel, Elmer's SDA Church. And please join us on November 13 from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m for our free cooking class, Healthy Recipes for the Holidays. And all recipes are going to be vegetarian and vegan. And we'll end our session. And those of you who are here with us in person are welcome to have some refreshments in our community lifestyle center before you leave. Thank you and have a good day. And happy Sabbath.